All right, so welcome to Bob's Radio once again. And uh, this particular episode, we've thought we'll do something a little different. We're not inside the studio. In fact, uh, we've managed to have someone create a studio atmosphere <laughs> for us in their home, the home studio, Mr. Vineet Vincent. So uh, we're here to talk to Vineet about not just him as a musician, but also his journey from uh, a beatboxer to event manager to a lot of things that an artist does. Basically, you're a hustler. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we constantly see you hustling, doing a lot of things, and I also hear that you're like this uh, yellow pages for musicians in Bangalore, <laughs> right? We're going to sit and discuss all that. But before that, I want to thank you because, uh, of course, with all the circumstances, we <laughs> were scared to do this in the studio, but because of whatever that happened, yeah, we're finally doing it. And for thank you for arranging everything that is, uh, you know, levels that we should look up to when we start <laughs> doing content. <laughs> But nevertheless, Vinny, thank you so much for having us. I think we should give a shout out to the 31st Production Boys also because they set up all of this, they set up everything. So, yeah, and it's a pleasure to actually do this with you. Um, yeah, we'll come to some of those questionable conversations in a little while. But yeah, let's do this. And also I have to mention this, we're hmm. two pin code 47 boys. Yeah, man. Two MCs from the city. Yeah, man. Two boys in the same color. Yeah, man. Do you want to more about that? No, 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 no. <laughs> so I think we'll go easy on the first podcast. We'll, I'll, I'll jump in on a bunch of other podcasts. Like when Vivek George comes by, I will jump in on that and a few others. I'll just randomly show up and I'll invite myself for these podcasts. For sure. And uh, we'll let you know when that happens as well. Done, done, done. And of course, we want to have the whole area wipe. And we know, we know Danish also did his whole uh, uh video about you know how uh, the area boys discuss finance cholrango the cholrango boys mm. we'll do that but now we have to talk mr vinith vincent mm. talk about vinith vincent so to start with now i just want to understand this part of it right the world record that you set which not a right. lot of people know and right. yet a lot more know as well mm. one is about the guinness world records and one is about the limca book of world records yeah. uh could you please yeah so you were there for one of them you were at the guinness world record right. i think it was feb if i'm not mis- mistaken of 2011 mm-hmm. so the world records are not in my name they are in the name of christ junior college and christ university my job was to direct them and make sure they were executed and so the first record was set at 2136 i'm assuming people okay. beatboxing at the same time right. with perfect timing and perfect unison the second record which was set Uh, a couple of weeks later was set at 1236 people beatboxing at the same time okay. 36 or 46 46 i, I checked 46. the numbers okay uh, and you were there for that yeah, yeah. i think you were one of the adjudicators for that event i got paid bro so i was there <laughs> <laughs> right right you all were brought in as external judges uh-huh. for the event and so we had to get you all to sign to say that you're external to the college and you were from joseph's right yeah, yeah. if from joseph's so not college school though what no you You were in college. We were all in college. Uh but not St. Joseph's College. I was from Surana. From Surana. Surana would be proud now. Don't you think? Oh my. Shout out to Surana. I'm a Purana from Surana. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Okay, yeah. So we had to get people adjudicators external to people who are tied to the university or to the college because we don't want someone saying ah it's okay let's just give them a few extra people and say ah these people are also uh-huh. beatboxing right so we wanted you all to be really hard on us and cut off the people who were in beatboxing and yeah the entire idea was to get people to come together uh to work together because you know in in colleges be it marks or be it at let's say a fest everyone's always going up against each other and no one's working together to create something bigger than right. themselves and so uh, when we were talking about this i came up with the random idea of saying let's just get everyone together in the auditorium mm-hmm. and let's get them to work together to create a record and so we ended up creating two records the guinness world record was later broken by shlomo in the uk and i think it's currently broken in like a massive way by i think about 10,000 people Whoa. in china so i think we should come back boys we should come back and break that record here in uh, karnataka maybe with bfc bra with wait, wait, at, at the games yeah we should we should and uh, bobs radio should be partnering i i agree <laughs> yes bobs radio should be the partner for this and we should break it because how many people can fit fit in that stadium uh, capacity is about 35 and we've seen uh, average attendance of more than 10,000 Hmm. So I'm guess it it should be possible yeah. it's something we'll always talk to them and yeah. see how we can run that but uh, records we'll put that aside because yeah. you're bound to be breaking a lot of them <laughs> 
Hopefully. But uh, when you started off beatboxing, you know, right. it was something new in the city. But of course, the hip-hop culture was there. Right. You were not the only beatboxer. And mm. you were not the only Vinit also that time. Ah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, did you have any instances where, you know, people would refer to you as Beep and Beep yeah. as you and some yeah. funny instances that came so by? So now, actually, people think I am him. Back then, people used to think he is me. And he had this funny thing on his phone where he would, uh, I forget what he used to store my name as. We should call him and ask him what my name was stored. I, I don't know if it's imposter or it's uh, <laughs> the other Vineet. I think he stored my name as the other Vineet or something questionable. And uh, should we call him? Go for it. Uh, yeah. And there was this weird thing about how... Uh, one sec. Let's see if he picks up. That's the most important part. <laughs> now, this is about up. directing our content. If he doesn't answer, what do we do? <laughs> mm, correct. <laughs> so, oh, he's just too big to pick up now. Uh, he's not picking up. But basically, he had something very questionable for me. And yeah, I was the... Uh, he put my name as the other Vineet. Uh-huh. And so... But now, that boy has become huge. He's massive in the industry, right? So... Like hats off to what he's done so far. But he's not even in Bangalore. <laughs> he's not? That's not a Bangalore. Oh no, that's his idea. actually his, oh, his Bombay, Bombay number. number. Yeah. It's his Bombay number when he moved to Bombay. So oh uh, yeah. Like I was saying, mm, when I started off back in 2007, I didn't know who Beep was back then. And uh when I was also traveling the country and I was in Bombay, I was in Delhi, there was no one doing it professionally. And which is kind of weird. And when I came back to Bangalore, so I went to Ahmedabad as well. Came back to Bangalore by March of 2008, I decided this was going to be something I did to make money. Mm -hmm. Because I wanted to stand out from the rest of the entertainers, from the rest of the MCs. Because I was also MCing by 2007. So I think I met Beep at a college event. I can't remember which college. It's either St. Joseph's or MCC. One of these two. And I... The way he tells the story is he, he walked up to me and he's like, hey man, uh, my name is Vineet. I was like, hey, that's so cool. I'm also Vineet. He's like, yeah. And he's like, I also beatbox. I was like, oh, okay. And <laughs> apparently I just continued looking at the stage after that. And he's like... <laughs> was there any rivalry brewing at there? No, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, at least in my head there wasn't. I don't know about his. We should ask him, get him on the podcast and ask Someday, him this for question. Sure, for sure. And when he answers the call first. <laughs> <laughs> when he first answers our calls. But um, I don't think there was because right after that, he and I vibed really well because we're both Tamilians. We're both middle class boys. Uh, both beneath. Funnily, he, try, he tried to get into the same course as I applied for in oh, Christ. Okay. And apparently he didn't get in. And so he went to Krista Jayanti instead. And so we were going to be in the same class as well. And we have the same first names. And we're both Tamilians. And there was something else that also tied us together. I forget what, obviously, the beatboxing uh, bit. Was it the karaoke that you used to host back in the day? He no? never hosted karaoke. Okay. I never hosted karaoke. Because I, I think know. he did host for some bit, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. Because I remember him calling me up and asked me to, you know, uh, substitute him sometime. That was me. No. Listen, man, it wasn't you. <laughs> I, think, course, I think he course. just got the, both the Vinits confused. No, 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 I no, no. called you once. I never differentiated saying the other Vinit. It was always Vincent and Beep on my Vincent phone. Vincent and Beep. It wasn't beeping Vincent but, also. <laughs> <laughs> but I called you once. We did speak. We did yeah. speak in uh, uh, exchange of events and stuff. I'm not saying no, but mm. I'm telling you that there's one time that he did call me for karaoke. Oh. It was. There was one time. So I thought maybe he did karaoke too. As a karaoke jockey. Can you imagine? Hmm. I'm, I can imagine him making memes and you know trolling about it now but <laughs> <laughs> oh times. man but, but yeah that's, that's where you started and we also so when I used to get gigs since he and I had such a good vibe on stage and even off stage uh, I used to pitch him as well to mm-hmm. every single event that I, I, I did moving forward and I used to take him with me to a bunch of gigs and we started touring across the entire country after a while um, the one thing we don't talk about though is him, me, Nasa, and Likit actually went and auditioned for India's Got Talent. Okay. I forget which year this was at. Uh, uh, and we hated the experience. And so it wasn't our vibe at all. But we went, we performed, we did the entire thing. I'm very um, curious if you could just elaborate. Like, what do you mean it wasn't your vibe? I, so, I mean, this is for TV. 
I think Beep and I back then, including NASA and Likit, were more live performers. Right. We weren't TV guys. And that's changed now, where Beep and NASA have made their living off being on the screen. Mm-hmm. And they've blown up after being on the screen. But back then, we just didn't feel the vibe. We didn't feel the love. And so we just came back and we continued doing live. So, Was it something to do with the response from the audience or the judges of sorts or whatever? No, actually, I think... Okay, so what happens on the back end, you don't always see right. the same thing on, on TV, right? So I don't, even, I don't even remember if we got through. I think we got through. Okay. We got through, but we didn't get a call back or something like that. So they figure what goes on, like the producers on the back end, I think, figure out who goes on. I mean, um, of course, like yeah. what, what interests the audience, but what yeah, matters yeah. a lot more about. Their TRP and whatnot. What does well for them is mm-hmm. what they will push forward. But Nikhil Chinapa was there. He was the host, the host of, of the it that day. year. Um, and I think he also kind of knew us because... Mm-hmm. From the city and events, yeah. of course, you keep meeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was one of our third or fourth hellos with him. And, um, you know, see how this is so natural. But with something like that, there's a lot of pretending as well. For right. example, we'll open the door and then you have to run out. Uh-huh. You have to be like... Mm, all of that. So I'll tell you, this is... Uh, <laughs> If on radio, when you're doing a voiceover, they always tell us to dramatize 20 yeah. times more of whatever you yeah. say, right? Yeah. Uh, if you're doing a uh, ad or anything. So if just for audio is that much, can you imagine what yeah. else can be done for video? Yeah. So, But it's still, see, for example, if you're saying, welcome to Bob's Radio. My name is Vineet Vincent and you're listening to Bob's Radio. Right? Something like that. But it's still very natural if you think about if it. If you think about it, because you know what? You and I have grown up in the city and we know... We're not too dramatic. We're, we're very simple people. Mm. There's a reason why it was called the pensioner's paradise. Of course, we've evolved over time into so much right. of tech and uh, education. Every, like mass media as well. Yeah. No one thought mass media was big in the city. Right. But then no one connected with the soul of the city. Yeah. In terms when I say there was always an anglicized crowd in the city. Yeah. Right. But that was not focused on. Of course, the Karna uh, speaking audience got their due share. Mm. Uh, so the reason why even on Bob's, I'm very, very chill. Is because the city just does that to you. Mm. And with the weather like this, uh, <laughs> who wouldn't be chill? It's actually raining outside. It, it is, was, as yeah. we speak. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you don't know when the video is out though, but it is raining. <laughs> I hope it rains when you're watching it as well. But yeah, so that's when you started, you moved to India's Got Talent. Yeah. And I understand where that story comes from in terms of uh, amplifying the dramatics and right. having a lot more theatrics. Right. So from there, you started beatboxing, emceeing. Uh, just to understand the number of events you would have done this till now. Do you have a count? I kept a count up until I hit 700. Okay. After that, I just, I got so disinterested. I couldn't keep track of it anymore because you're just sometimes jumping city to city. Mm -hmm. Uh, You're barely sleeping. So, but as of now, I'm approximating a little over 1,800 gigs since 2005. And that's when I realized I enjoyed doing that. Right. And I realized every single thing that I've, I've been doing so far just didn't make sense because there's some form of happiness to be able to sit and just communicate ideas in the form of this Mm -hmm. or in the form of music. And I think that was my first realization that I was sort of built to be an entertainer. Right. And so I started doing gigs there. This guy named Rajiv Ramanani who runs the place got me my first mic, my first speaker, my first mic stand. Mm -hmm. Um, I, Jeff, yeah. Taught me how to play my first few chords. I was going to come to that. Yeah, yeah. And then, so I learned, let's say, 10 chords. And I went and I started playing a bunch of tracks. I think we used to do about 15, 20 songs back then. And it was a lot of fr- fun. So from there, I went to trying to being an MC in 2007. So between five to seven, I did approximate about three shows a month. Uh, sorry, a week. Mm-hmm. Three shows a week. And sometimes I would do four shows a week as well. And then finally... 2007 when the emceeing kicked in I was pretty much working five days five shows a week or if not more and then 2008 when beatboxing kicked in um, the first month I did I'm forgetting the numbers I'm getting old it's anywhere between 30 to 35 shows in the first month same for the second month same for the third month but how do you discover this beatboxing um, as, as, as an art, like, you know, right. where did you see it? So in college, uh, I used to be part of the acapella team. And there oh, so was... You went to college only for acapella, not to start <laughs> class. Seems like that the way you went to college. I mean, see, I did flunk my first pew. I okay. flunked my second pew. Uh, I did enjoy the cultural side of things more than I did 
the studying side of things. And if I'm being really honest with you, studying wasn't my cup of tea. Education wasn't so-called like the mainstream we education. Understand. Wasn't my cup of tea. And um, the more and more I tried to compete with my peers, the more and more I failed. Mm -hmm. So let's say if I was weak in math, um, I would have to do tuitions after that. So I'd waste time in tuitions and I'll still come back and get two or three out of 100, mm -hmm. right? So no matter how much of time I put in, I was still going up against people who are, math comes naturally to. And for me, I look at numbers and I'll start flipping. And, uh, <laughs> it makes no sense to me. And I think now we're starting to understand that there's more beyond just the marks and... Yeah, yeah. And not just that, that people are wired differently. Numbers come natural to some people. Numbers are not natural can't for some do it, people. Bugger. Just can't yeah, do it. <laughs> we can't. By the way, uh, do you know the meaning of bugger? Have uh, you ever looked at it? Go for up? it, if, since, since you want to enlighten us. Uh, do you know the meaning of bugger? Do you? You? Okay. So, according to Google, <laughs> bugger is someone who likes taking it in the backside. Mm -hmm. This yeah. is a Brit term for it. I think so. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> That's why they said behind the back door bugger. <laughs> oh, 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 I did not know this. But yeah, this is something I learned recently. We were talking about education. Oh, yeah. So coming back to <laughs> See, the we point. still keep educating. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know, right? We're educating the population. Um, and so you're put into tuitions. You're wasting time in trying to perfect a skill that you're never going to be as good as, let's say, the first 10 ranks. Mm -hmm. And so I had 100 students in, in my class and I was always on the other end of the spectrum. I was your 92 to your 100. Right. And I was stuck there. Right. And the first to 10 were, were always the ones getting 99.5. Then one girl will get 98 and burst out crying because, you know, she See, I, I don't understand. See, I don't understand that section of people at all. Because always the <laughs> other section of people who will get the 99.5% of times that I got zero. Right. <laughs> That's me. That kind of people is what I know. Yeah. yeah. But that's the thing and then we're told to compete with these people what's the point of competing with people that you will never even come close to right mm -hmm. and so when you find all of these things that you're not good at why focus on it but is it, are you saying this uh, competing with people was an environment that you studied in that's how we're brought up okay. we're brought up to compete with everyone and i was talking about how we go to fest we are supposed to compete in fest mm -hmm. of course it's really good to get your skills up there but if Let's say someone who has zero knowledge of music is starting to learn music now mm -hmm. and then comes and tries to compete with someone, let's say, like a Who's Jonathan, there for donkeys, like a Jonathan yeah. Anand Wesley or a Judah, mm -hmm. and they start producing now. So that makes no sense, right? So they might as well do something that they're really good with and focus on that. So, yeah, I think that is something I just understood early on. And yeah, I just stuck to the music. I stuck to the emceeing and the beatboxing. I would have loved to do music, but the money was horrible. Mm -hmm. Back in 2005, 2006, someone like a thermal and a quarter would be getting paid about 3,000, 5,000 rupees to do a pub kind of a game. Really? Yeah, back then. I'm guessing. Maybe they'll come and slap me after this. And, I mean, I don't know. How dare you say these things? But I mean, I've seen, because back then... It was just come and have a drink with us and, you know, what are the names of these places? Shucks, there was one on 80 feet road. Uh, Legends of Rock. Hello, uh, Legends of Rock was there. There's Legends of Rock. Where then else I did these gigs uh, happen? Kyra was there. No, not in 2005. 2005, Kyra? 2005, not Kyra. I'm guessing you, damn, I can't even put a place. 2005, I was just in school. I was just discovering uh, the live concerts in the city. So I, so I used to go and remember was watch cities. Galij Gurus. I used to go and watch Thermal and a Quarter. Uh, who else were the big musicians back then? These guys were bosses. Right. And so if they were getting paid something like that, I was getting paid about 200 bucks to do a, a show. Mm -hmm. And so keep in mind, there's the food expenses, there's the travel expenses, uh, carrying around your own equipment and going and setting it up all for 200 bucks to play, let's say, a two hour set. It was nothing. I think uh, I did promotional jobs for about two to 50 as exactly. well. So I'm guessing. But that's simpler, that's easier, right? I mean, that's something when you when you compare the two, it's not like you should, but when you look at what the work is, yeah. this is art. Yeah. And it's just like one small thing that you want to earn pocket money. Yeah. Both are the same ways of earning money, yeah. but just the value that you look at this. Yeah. Uh man, hats off to you for you know to sticking to it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we're coming back to the whole beatboxing part of it. Where did you pick it up? Acapella. So it started with Acapella and 
all I would do was things like that. Mm-hmm. But I realized later on that you could do so much more. There was this guy named Blake Lewis who showed up on American Idol. Right. I think he was one of the people that showed me that the human voice could be a lot more versatile than what I was doing. Mm-hmm. Then I started practicing and I heard this guy named Gabriel from the US who was in Christ College at that mm-hmm. time. He was beatboxing with an acapella team from Christ. They were the A-team of Christ. So I heard him Then there was this guy named Mark Swaroop. Do you know Mark Swaroop? Yeah, yeah, yeah. photographer. Yeah, but Mark Swaroop used to do more of my style of... Okay. Right? I still remember Boots and Cuts. Boots right. and cuts. <laughs> but back then, there was no Boots and Cuts. Okay. That came after YouTube came in, which is, let's say, 2008, 2009. Uh-huh. Um, and even after that, people weren't putting beatbox content on YouTube. YouTube was just starting to show its face hmm. because we still couldn't stream music videos on your phone. Hmm. Like we could not do any of these things. And so, yeah, I think um, American Idol, Mark Swaroop, Gabriel, these three people, um, I took bits and pieces of each one of them and then I sort of formed my own style of what I wanted to be and who mm-hmm. Vineet Vincent was in terms of a sound as a beatboxer. And then I started coming up with the <laughs> sounds like that. Came up with them. Things like that, that I didn't hear these other beatboxers do. But the one thing that I did use from, let's say, Gabriel and the and Blake Lewis was the kick, the... And then I started learning my own snare, mm-hmm. which is the... Or the... Or the... So I used all of these sounds and started making a beatbox set. And I went to the same guys who used to hire me as an MC and said, okay, listen, I want to change things up a little bit. Uh, here's my new resume. And this is... beatboxing Mm -hmm. and a majority of them didn't understand they used to pitch me as a mimicry artist back then in 2007 and 8 Uh. and um, it didn't go too well because no one wants a mimicry artist who only does the sound of a a drum kit they're like he only makes the sound of a drum kit what's the point we can get someone to imitate uh, Raj Kumar and then Amitabh Bachchan and all he does all of these Mm. things so we have to pay this guy to just make the sound of a drum kit nobody understood that And so, uh, this is also just when the IT boom was also kicking in. Correct. Right? So, there's a lot of people moving in. HR was a, a, a new thing. So, we had to speak to the HR and convince them all of these things. But then, this gentleman named Tanvir Ahmed stepped in. And he took me and just pitched me left, right and center. And in fact, said, listen, I will pay for him. He will show up. If you don't like what he does, the bill is paid for my mm. end. If you like what he does... Mm. pay me for him. Right. And he just took me to every single gig that he did, pitched me to every single event manager that he knew um, and just took me around the city, took me outside the city and that's when I started sort of establishing myself as a beatboxer. He gave me the most number of shows in the beginning. Of course, I was also pitching to, let's say, 15, 20 other right. event managers at the same time. Tony gave me a bunch of gigs back then in 2008. Uh, who did he work for? Showhouse. Think, he worked for Showhouse? Or another event management He company. was with Showhouse. Showhouse. He was heading Showhouse, yeah. Right. But keep in mind, I was still the offbeat entertainer. I was not mainstream back Correct. then. So they would not pitch me as a mainstream entertainer. You'd be more then. like a filler. A filler. A tiny little filler that came so in for I, two So I was minutes. having this uh, talk with Gubbi the other day. Sorry to cut you off. No, no, please. So uh, back in the day, it, uh, rappers yeah. would come in as fillers. Yeah. beatboxers would come in and fill us. Yeah. And this is what used to be the case, but today look at it. Yeah. It, it, it's just grown. Yeah, it's the mainstream thing. But the funny thing is beatboxers still come in as fillers. We are not the main, let's say, performers or the main attractions because there's this guy named Divyansh. He's from Jaipur, currently based out of Bombay. He is the biggest thing with beatboxing in the country right now. Mm-hmm. Hands down the biggest thing in the country. Um, he got every single golden buzzer for... in Indian Idol Indian Idol no India's got talent India's got okay. talent um, for the last season and after which he went to uh, America's got talent mm-hmm. all stars oh. he and this other flottist represented India he has taken let's say what people like me and Beep have done in the country there's also this guy named Alan from Bombay um, who uh, beatboxes for Raga Trippin okay. they're also an amazing a cappella band you should check them out So all of these guys actually established what I think 
commercial beatboxing was in India. And then came the beatboxers who showed up in uh, Gully Boy. Okay. I think the movie's called Gully Boy. Yeah. I, I forget these guys' names. We'll, we'll show it as little pop-ups. Uh, B-roll footages. Gaurav, I think, is one of them. Gaurav is one of them. And yeah, so it's beatboxing is still very underground. Okay, I'm going to throw some numbers out there. I don't know whether I should. I might get into trouble. If you think about it, the biggest beatboxer in the world, uh, you can bring them down for, let's say, uh, five lakhs. Okay. The biggest beatboxer. And in the world. And this is for a performance of how long? I don't know. But okay. I'm just saying. The biggest okay. beatboxer in the world. I'm pretty sure if you talk to them and say, hey, mm-hmm. listen, we're still growing in the country, which is, we are growing in the country. Um, it's still very underground. So you still can get them for a five lakhs, let's say, come and judge and maybe beatbox. Mm-hmm. So the biggest rapper in the world or the biggest, let's say, comedian in the world will go in the millions of dollars. Yes, yeah, for sure. Right? So there's a massive discrepancy in how much beatboxers are still getting paid, not just in India, but across the world. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's something we also sort of need to focus on in terms of the economics of it. And it's not the main reason, but I also understand that, like I was there when the beat, beatboxing culture started off in the country, but now I'm trying to figure how can I go back to doing what I love doing, which is music. Right. And I'd like to make some good money. I'm 34 years old now. I don't, want, don't, don't, don't bring those age uh, numbers back. I want back to in, make you know, money. Showing on our faces. <laughs> and, but I want to make money doing what I love doing. And dude, I've lost a lot of like really good friends. You have lost a lot of really good friends. And I think as we, we get older, we start looking at how much of time we have left. We might as well do what we love doing and trying to try to make some money. I think I think it's more like I, I look at it this way: where as you grow older, uh, you tend to understand what you want for yourself and your priorities, and then everything else it starts vanishing by itself. Like the, whether it's yeah. friends, whether it's uh, you know just regular people yeah. you meet, the activities, everything just moves yeah. out, yeah. and then that's when your life becomes a little more clear. You get a lot more yeah. clarity, and uh, that's what you are doing now. We're going to talk about that, yeah. but just coming back to the beatbox thing that yeah. you were mentioning. Yeah. Now you were saying that. Yes, it is very hard. Can I very quickly cut you off? Sure. I also think we need to understand that different people are wired differently. Correct. Um, for example, some people think it's important to, let's say, um, have a family, have a wife, have kids, um, build a house. I think people like you and me haven't headed down that direction. I was not going to go down that direction to talk about it, but, yeah, but <laughs> you brought it up. Let's be honest. Yeah. Because I think... We it, it it doesn't turn us on. We don't wake up in the morning thinking, mm, "That's Damn, what I want to do." Wife, where's my child? Yeah, because we're just not wired that way. We want to wake up and just give meaning to our life in other ways. Because people wake up and they have a beautiful kid or a beautiful wife, and they're like, mm, "That's amazing." We want that in our life. I think someday, maybe, hopefully, fingers crossed, you and I get that. But if we don't. I think we both have tried to create art. We both have tried to give meaning to our lives. Meaning to our life. And I think that's also something to do with our generation that is breaking the stereotype of get finish your degree, get a job, get married, settle down. Yeah. And I think slowly our generations watch that opening the doors yeah. for a lot more people to you know just try and figure out exactly how to go about it, not a norm that's been created by society for the longest time. So I think that 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 eventually a lot of and I'm sure uh, there are a lot of numbers which I can't put because I don't know the numbers, but I know they're pretty star- stark to think about it. Like, uh, the number of people who who are getting married now are far lesser, or the rate, if you look at the population then and now, the rate at which people are getting married now is slower than the ones people are getting divorced at. You just confused my brain, but okay. The rate at which people are getting married now, right now. is slower than the rate people are getting divorced at. People are getting divorced faster than getting married now. Okay. Which means that there are a lot more people getting divorced than the number of people getting married.